I think it's time to just go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to say hello to everyone. Welcome to the Tennessee Native Plant Society seminar series. Tonight's seminar is uh, Dennis Wiggum talking about native orchids in Tennessee, their ecology and conservation needs. And Dennis is, uh, his primary interest and in his research has resulted in journeys through forests, fields, wetlands around the world. Um, explorations have led to studies of woodland herbs, including orchids, vines, wetland species, invasive species, and studies of forests in the tropics, temperate, and boreal zones. In recent years, studies of inter interactions between orchids and fungi have led in new and exciting directions. Dennis's current focus is on wetlands, including the role of wetlands associated with juvenile salmon habitat in Alaska. The rarest terrestrial orchid in eastern North America and invasive species. His current passion is to establish the North American Conservation Center, North American Orchid Conservation Center, which is an initiative of the Smithsonian and the United States Botanic Garden. Dennis is visiting us from Maryland, where he does some of his research, some of it in Alaska, and some of it any place in the world, I take it. So without further ado, I'm going to say welcome, Dennis, and I'm going to turn it all over to you. Thank you, Karen, and uh, thank all of you for taking your evening and joining in for this presentation. Uh, we were talking earlier about some of the advantages of these virtual meetings and at the Smithsonian, it's been the same for us. We have a we have our scientific uh, seminar series at our laboratory, but we also have a, a public seminar series. And historically, that was mostly for local people who came to our facilities to listen to the talks. But after COVID, uh, it's amazing. We have many, many more people on the talks. They're from all over the world. It's it's quite interesting. So. Uh, Hopefully uh, this evening, I, I'm going to do a couple of things. I'm going to uh, tell you about orchids and orchid ecology, and then I'm going to use that as a springboard to tell you about the orchid conservation effort that, that I started about, about a decade ago now, and give you the reasons uh, behind that. So with that as a, an entree, uh, I'm going to share my screen, and hopefully you will be able to see the first slide. Is that good, Karen? Looks perfect. Okay, so this is me. Uh, I'm a senior botanist. Uh, I'm really a, a, an ecologist by training, a plant ecologist. I did my PhD at the University of North Carolina in the dark ages when they had a botany department and and uh, they didn't have an ecology program, but that uh, I went there to work with an ecologist who ended up starting the first ecology program at the University of Tennessee after he he left North Carolina. And then, as I mentioned, about 10 years ago, I started an organization that's focused on the conservation of, of na native orchids. And the, uh, the part of the Smithsonian where I work is the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. It's a group of ecologists working out in the water all the way up to the land. We do have people that do modeling. We have people that do molecular work. We have a wide range of skill sets. And the um, main thing is we're all ecologists, and those are the kind of questions that uh, we we uh, we address. But uh, what I do in, in as it relates to to orchids is not just me. It's a small group of people that are very committed to this. One of them is Julianne McGinnis, who is uh, she's a contractor for us. She she is our program development coordinator. She was the director of the Alaska Botanical Garden when I first met her and started this activity. And and she's been working with us since she moved back east. Uh, Melissa McCormick is a colleague of mine for the last 23 years. Uh, she's a plant ecologist, but she also runs the molecular laboratory at, at our Smithsonian laboratory. And then another guy who's 
really been very involved over the years is Jay O'Neill. He's now retired. He was a head technician in my lab for about 40 years, and he maintains our websites now. And uh, you'll see that a lot of other people involved in what it is we're doing. So this is a map showing the, the distribution of orchids in North America. And the point to make is that they're everywhere. Uh, the highest numbers down here in Florida, based on the color code, you see it's more than 120 species down there. Uh, it's when you get out to the drier parts of the country uh, where you, uh, you end up um, uh, having fewer orchids. Uh, but even up in Alaska, there's uh, almost 40 species up there. Uh, the part of the world that you live in, whoops, sorry, has, uh, according to our website, has about 48 uh, native orchids in, in Tennessee. So you're at the higher end. And obviously, because you have a lot of different habitats there, that makes it a very mm -hmm. great place. Um, I went to, uh, to a website uh, to, to get some idea of what the situation was in Tennessee. And in this slide and the next one, you're going to see orchids, which are known to occur in Tennessee, but they are thought to be extinct now. And, uh, and with this, I'm going to make the point that uh, a lot of our naked, native orchids are in trouble. So you can see here, you have a wide range of species of the genus Spiranthes, Listera, Coeloglossum, uh, Platanthera species, several of them uh, here. Uh, they, that's, a, that's the most species rich genus of uh, orchids in North America. Uh, the second slide shows uh, one that's flowering here now, Pagonia. Uh, Cypripedium kentuckiense, Isotria medialoides, which I'm going to talk more about, small world pagoni. Here's another species of uh, Spiranthes here. And, and you also have, oh, that's the wrong name. Uh, that's uh, Cypripedium regini there. Uh, but uh, not always lost because it turns out that uh, that little smiley up there with uh, Isotria means that it's not extinct in, in Tennessee. And it was actually found uh, again uh, this last year on private property, and and we're in touch with people who are trying to get the developer to set that area aside. So this number is roughly the the number of native orchid species in the U.S. and Canada. It's not a large number, but um, it, it's a lot to work with. And it, for comparison, there are probably somewhere in the neighborhood of twenty five to thirty thousand species of orchids around the world. It's the most species rich family of flowering plants on earth. Lots and lots of orchids, there's been a lot of evolution. Uh, now, if, if you look at the roughly 220 species that we have in, in the US and Canada, um, what percent of them do you think are in trouble uh, some place where they occur? Uh, you might wanna think about that for a minute, but I'm gonna show you what the number is. It's almost 60%. And so this is actually the thing that got me interested in the conservation side of it. If you have more than half of the species that are in our country that are in trouble someplace, that's worth somebody paying attention to. I'm gonna give you uh, two examples of, of, of how this has occurred and at least evidence that species of orchid are declining as long as, as well as other plants. So this is a publication by Mike uh, Pace who is, at the uh, in in New York, and he published this uh, article in the memoirs of the Tory Botanical Club in Society in 2020. This is the Arethusa bulbosa, a dragon's mouth orchid. And by looking at herbarium specimens and any other kind of evidence he could get, he came up with a with this map that you see on the left. So around 1850, this species was all over New York, all over Long Island, a lot of it on Long Island. In 1900, about 50 years later, not so different, somewhat fewer dots on this map. By the next 50 years, by 1950, things had really changed. You can see the number of dots had really declined, only two of them on Long Island. And by 2017, the last year that he, he worked with the, these data, you can see that we're down to very few known populations of this species and only one out here on Long Island. Another species that he worked with was a, one of the coral arises, uh, the northern coral root, and basically the same deal. 1850, a lot of plants. 1900, still quite a lot of plants, populations. By 1950, not so many. And by 2017, we're down to about four populations. And 
there are very few places where you can go and gather this kind of information. He was quite lucky to actually find this for New York. But my feeling is that this is the kind of thing that's been going on, and particularly in, you know, since the 1950s, I think a lot of our orchids have been uh, declining in, in areas where they occur. I'll give you another example. We have a project out in uh, Arizona now. Uh, it's a landscape project. We're working with people out there that are trying to hold water on the land a little bit longer. And we think that's, if that can be successful, we think that's also good for orchids because it's very dry out there typically. And there aren't a lot of orchids. And so if you can create orchid habitat, that's got to be good. And we're working with this, this uh, Canelo Hills Ladies Tresses. And it's only known in four sites in Arizona. That's, you know, the world. That's the only place where it occurs. And last year, we've been out there to start this project. Here is here is the orchid. Here's one of the habitats. The flags show where the flowers are or the plants are located. And uh, but two of the sites where it's known to occur are it's not there anymore. At least they haven't found it for years. And so one of the things we're trying to do is to understand its ecology, but eventually hope to restore it to to at least the two sites where it's now not present. So I'm giving you these couple of examples just to make the point that I, I believe there's a critical need for the conservation of, of native orchids. And there are people that do this. Uh, there are different approaches to orchid conservation. I'm just gonna describe them to you. Uh, I'm not gonna show any pictures because of time limitations. So one way is to protect them by law. Uh, we have laws in this country, the Endangered Species Act that protects plants and animals. A lot of work, some orchids are there. Uh, internationally, there's the IUCN Red List. Uh, all orchids are on this list. You, this is to regulate the international trade of, of uh, orchids. Uh, some organizations are involved in conserving land where orchids occur. One organization is the Orchid Conservation Alliance, which is based in California. They mostly do their work in Central and uh, but primarily in, in South America. Uh, you would think that botanical gardens are places where we could conserve native orchids, but in fact, that's really not happening. There are almost all of the major botanical gardens in the U.S. have orchids, but many, many of them have no native orchids. And if they do, they'll have maybe one or, or two species. Really not, it's not conservation, it's just sort of showing orchids. And then there are uh, a few organizations that are involved in, in the restoration, knowing that some orchids are in trouble. One of the great projects is down at the Fairchild Tropical Garden in uh, Tropical Botanic Garden in Miami. They have the Million Orchid Project. I would encourage you to get on the internet sometime and learn about that project. There are a lot of efforts in the middle part of the country to restore the Eastern Prairie Fringed Orchid. And uh, there's a colleague of ours in Singapore that is uh, committed to restoring native orchids there. He's learned how to grow them uh, in, in his uh, greenhouses and laboratory, and he, uh, he attaches them to trees out on the streets in Singapore, and, and it's an incredible sight. So there are examples of orchid conservation, but um, there really is nothing in the U.S. That, that is at the scale of the entire country, and that's why I started this North American Orchid Conservation Center. Uh, with some initial money from the Smithsonian and the U.S. Botanic Garden was very helpful at the outset. This logo is actually meaningful, and I hope you'll understand it by the time I finish tonight. So if you're going to conserve native orchids, you have to know something about the orchid as shown here. Uh, I'm going to go into quite a bit of detail about the fungi that orchids need, and so you have to be able to involve the fungi in the conservation of the orchids. And of course, these two things have to occur in nature. And so the, the environment where the orchid occurs has to be just right. And that's what the leaves represent. That's an ecosystem. And, and I don't believe we'll, we'll accomplish this unless we involve a lot of people. So a lot of my time is spent in trying to identify individuals and organizations that are supportive of what uh, we're doing. Our mission is very simple. We, in the end, want to conserve all of the native orchids in the U.S. and Canada. Eventually, though, the model that we have, I believe, is global in context, and we, we can work outside of the, the boundaries of the U.S. and Canada. So we employ an, an evolutionary and an ecological approach to, to the work that we do. And one of the things that's important is genetic diversity. 
So my guess is if you have an orchid in Western Tennessee and you could, in a population, and you could analyze its level of genetic diversity and you had that same orchid occurring in Maine and you did an analysis of the genetic diversity of the ones in Maine, uh, they're gonna be different. And so one reason to capture the genetic diversity of the orchids is that uh, you wanna work local. If we're gonna do something in Tennessee, we wanna work with material from Tennessee. If we're gonna work in California, we wanna work with material in uh, California. Uh, some orchids have very low genetic diversity. This is an example of uh, uh, the small world pagonia, uh, which is federally threatened. So anywhere this occurs on, on public land, uh, you, you can't collect it. You can't do anything with it. It's protected by, by federal law. And many states also protect it. So the populations are small. It's not a very common plant. You, you don't find it very often. Its genetic diversity is low because it's, it's selfing, it's inbreeding, which is one way that plants lose a lot of their genetic diversity. And we know that the Southern populations, uh, based on some work that Judy Stone did, I re referenced her article down here, shows that the Southern populations are really depauperate. They have low genetic diversity. And this is a map showing the known distribution of isotria. Uh, it's an eastern species. It occurs in eastern forest. Uh, it was last seen in Canada in 1998. So as far as we know, it's extinct in Canada. And it was found in Vermont and Tennessee in 2022. It was thought to be extinct in Vermont. They found one population. And I mentioned there's one population that's been found in, in your state also. So we don't know how many orchids are in this category having low genetic diversity. That's the some of the work we're trying to do. Uh, um, I'm gonna show you something that I hope you'll think is interesting. Uh, how do you find these orchids? Well, you can go out in the woods and you can spend a whole lot of time searching and that works. But we've recently been working with the Fish and Wildlife Service on training dogs to smell orchids. And I'm sure you're all aware going through airports and things like that, that they can train dogs to find all kinds of things. I'm gonna show you a very short video of uh, dogs finding this isotria orchid at Fort AP Hill in Virginia, where we're gonna to go tomorrow. So you'll see the dog coming in on the right. It's been trained not to identify the flags. That's where orchids occur. It's only been trained to smell the leaves of the orchid. And when it finds it, it sits and gets a reward. And uh, this work is continuing uh, with the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, there are some orchids that have a lot of genetic diversity. Uh, this is one that many of you in Tennessee might have seen. This is the uh, pink lady slipper orchid, uh, Cypripedium acali. Uh, you can find populations that have white plants with white flowers and plants that have quite lovely pink flowers and everything in between. This is a species with very high levels of genetic diversity that's been documented in a publication by Fred Chase back in the 1990s. But what, what really is important is, is the, the life cycle of orchids. And I don't know how much you know about this, but I'm gonna go through this for you. As people interested in botany, you know that most plants start out with seeds. The seeds have an, each seed has an embryo in it and the seed germinates. And the seed in most plants grows and becomes a seedling. This would be a little tiny plant with the first leaf. And the seedling gets bigger and it's a vegetative plant. It doesn't flower. This may go on for quite a long period of time in some cases, but eventually the plant gets big enough or old enough to flower and it becomes a flowering plant. And the flowering plant uh, sets seeds. And so this cycle begins over and over and over. So to have a sustainable population, something that will go on and on and on, plants have to go through all of this. But orchids are a little bit different than just about every other group of plants on the planet in that they have a stage between the seed and the seedling that is called a protocorm. All orchids have this. I'm gonna show you some pictures of this in a few minutes. The thing to remember about this stage is that the, the orchid seed is very tiny. The embryo that's in the seed is, does not have any stored food. Most plants put, the mother plant puts food in the seed so that when the seed germinates, the little baby can grow. If you think of a bean, for example, when it comes out of the ground, the, 
two cotyledons that are at the base of the beanstalk. The thing about this stage in the life of the orca, though, is it's it's not green. It, it cannot make its own food. And as people interested in botany, you know, plants photosynthesize, right? So if a plant, if an embryo germinates, becomes a protocorm and it's not green, how does it ever become a seedling? How does it grow if it can't photosynthesize? Uh, I'll answer that in a minute. But but orchids also have a dormant, many species, we don't know how many now, have what's called a dormant phase. And the, the deal here is that these plants can stay underground for different periods of time. That pink lady slipper I was showing you a picture of, we know from work that a colleague of ours has done at the University of Maryland, that those plants can stay underground for up to 25 years. So when you think about that, how does a plant, a green plant with leaves, stay below ground, never appear for decades, and then all of a sudden appear. How, how does that work? Well, it turns out that's where the fungus comes in. So all plants on earth interact with fungi. And the interaction in most plants is beneficial to the green plant as well as to the fungus. That, that process is called mutualism. And orchids are no different, except it's not really mutual in the sense for orchids. So uh, fungi, or interact at every life history stage of an orchid. So if you go out and collect an orchid in nature and analyze that plant, very likely you're going to find that it has a fungus associated with it at almost all stages. This, uh, this evolution of plants having these interactions with fungi and having these stages that are not green, protocorms and dormant plants, has, has really uh, blossomed in the orchids. There are many orchid species that have evolved to have no leaves at all. They go through their entire life without photosynthesis. And again, how does a plant do that? It turns out it's that the orchids eat fungi. So they interact with the fungi. As far as we know, they give very little back to the fungus. They really just take advantage of the fungus. The group of orchids, which uh, don't have leaves and interact with fungi at every stage of their life and depend on it at every stage of their life. There's a term for that. It's called mycoheterotrophy. And, uh, and this has evolved in different groups within the orchid family. Uh, the coral arises are probably one of the better known genera in our world. Uh, but we know that from our work and others that at all life stages, there are fungi associated with our native orchids so that they get some of their carbon from photosynthesis and they get some of their carbon from fungi. That's called partial heterotrophy, partial mycoheterotrophy. This is an example of that. So here are different species of the genus Coralariza. And they represent a spectrum over here on the left. This group are the green represents, they photosynthesize, they have leaves. The ones over here on the right, this is the common one in our forest where I work, doesn't have any leaves at all. And you can see there's no green down here on this side. And so from left to right, you're, what you're looking at are a group of plants that uh, in some cases, they really rely on photosynthesis. And on the other hand, they rely on uh, eating fungi and there's every, everything in between. And that's sort of represented up here where a plant that gets all of its carbon from photosynthesis is called an autotrophic plant. And, and then as you go over here in the right, this is fully mycoheterotrophic. And that's, that's ex an example of that is Coralariza uh, odontoriza, the autumn coral root. Now I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the, these early life history stages. Uh, we knew very little about this stage in the life of orchids. Most of what we knew for a long time was from laboratory work. And these photographs are taken in the laboratory. These are four orchids that occur in the forest where I do my work here at the Smithsonian. This is an evergreen species, Goodyear pubescens. This is a, a species that's blooming now, Liparis lilifolia. It's a, it has spring, spring, comes up in the spring with leaves, lasts most of the summer. Uh, a plectrum hyamali, the putty root orchid, is one that has a leaf in the winter, but not in the summer. And then here's this coralariza, this mycoheterotrophic one. 
And what you can see in these pictures are, um, I've drawn arrows to the seeds with an embryo in the seed. Here's one, here's one up here, here's one over here. And once those seeds germinate in the laboratory, growing them on auger, where we, you know, we know what goodies to give them, they grow into these protocorns. And you can see the protocorns come in different shapes and, and of course, different sizes. But you see they're not, they're not white, they're not green. So uh, we can also do this with, put fungi in with these seeds and grow the protocorms with the fungi too. But uh, what, what happens in nature? How, how do you know what's going on in nature? That's the problem because orchid seeds are really tiny and, and you can't find them in the soil. So uh, this lady, Hannah Rasmussen, she came over from Denmark uh, some years ago and worked with us for two years. She was one of the leaders in in training people and getting people interested in the fungal side of this story. And she and I were wondering if there's some way we could really study orchid seeds in nature. And we came up with this idea here in the lower left, where you take plankton netting, basically something with holes in it that are small enough that the orchid seed won't fall through it. You put the orchid seeds in it, fold it over and put it into a slide mount. Uh, and then you can put these out in the field and retrieve them at different times. And you can learn a lot from that. So here's Melissa McCormick, my collaborator, working with uh, Isotri in West Virginia. And here's a box with the seed packets in and we're, we're putting them in the soil, in the very shallow soil. So these seed packets give us two kinds of information. If, if we open up one of the seed packets and we see germination, we, we know the seeds have germinated. And one of the things that we're inter we have been interested in is how long these orchid seeds can live in the soil. And most people thought they were very delicate and didn't live very long. Well, we know now that's not the case. Uh, orchid seeds can live, they're tough. They can live a long time in the soil, uh, up to decades. The other advantage of using this technique, <clears throat> which has been adapted all around the world now, is if you open up a seed packet and you find a little baby orchid like this one, Here's the first leaf, here's the first root. This part of it here is the protocorn. And what we can do is we can take this into the laboratory and look at it under a microscope, do some molecular work, and we can ask the question of whether or not the fungus that the orchid needs at this stage of its life is the same as the fungus that it needs when it's a bigger plant. The answer is we don't know for many orchids yet, but we know it can be quite different. Uh, here's an example of, of what we've learned from these, these seed packets. The, uh, this is Isotria again. Here are two seed packets that Bill Brumbach, a colleague of ours in, in uh, New England, he buried, we, he sent us seeds, we made the seed packets, sent them to him, and he, they were in the ground for 13 years and he sent them to us. We opened them up and here's what we found. There's still plenty of seeds in the seed packet, and we have a technique where we can stain the embryos to see if they're still alive. And if they take up the stain, they're this color or dark red, that means they're still alive. So these, these seeds were in the ground for 13 years and they're still happy and happy and healthy. Now, I'll just show you one slide of dormancy. This isotria that we do a lot of work with, we know from monitoring individual plants in populations that we've had plants come up 13 years after we first saw it. We saw it one year, it disappeared, came back 13 years later. This uh, uh, pink lady slipper that I mentioned, we know they can stay in the ground for 25 years. So how does that happen? It happens because of the fungi. So how, how do we go about this to do conservation? So we have a model for orchid conservation. Uh, one, we want to preserve the seeds and the fungi. So we want to collect seeds from as many places as we can and store them. We wanna collect fungi and grow them in the lab and have them available from as many places as possible. Then we wanna take the seeds and the fungi and we wanna learn how to propagate the orchids. And what are we gonna do when we propagate them? Well, we can put them in botanic gardens. We can, we can do restoration in places where they used to occur and we'd like to put them back there. And we also are very interested in education because we feel that many people in our country are botanically illiterate. They don't even know where their food comes from. And so anything we can do to educate the public about orchid ecology, we think is beneficial. So we, I'm gonna show you a few things that we've been, uh, been doing. And, and one of the reasons I think education is important other than 
educating people is that everybody knows what orchids are. You can buy them in any drugstore or any grocery store in the country now, and everybody likes orchids. So if you mention the word orchid, it resonates with somebody. So how do we go about this? Well, it turns out that here are the ideas on what we want to do, but we need people. They're just a small number of us. And to make this work, we need the public to be involved. And that's why I have the little, little uh, stick people down here. So how do we conserve the, the genetic diversity of orchids and seed banks? Well, that's actually pretty easy, but it turns out that it's not been done because most people thought orchid seeds are a little bit weird and different from other plants. And so nobody has systematically done this, but what you can do, here's a diagram of orchid seeds that have different shapes. They all have little appendages on them. They're all wind dispersed. And here's a, here's a fruit of an orchid and we've taken the seeds out and orchid fruits typically have tens of thousands, if not millions of seeds. And so through evolution, what the orchids have done is the mother orchid doesn't put any food in each individual seed. She just has the embryo in theirs. And this, the ecological strategy is that gives them the energy to make millions of seeds, which are wind dispersed. And hopefully one of them will fall in the right spot where there's the fungus in the right habitat. And here is a picture of a fruit of of uh, Coralorhiza odontorhiza. This comes up in the autumn. It doesn't have leaves. These are basically nothing but seed machines. They're only above ground for about a month and a half. And all they're there for is to make babies. What you can do with this material is you take it to the lab and you put it over something that'll bring the humidity down to about 35%. And then you can store them in jars like this. And you can store them in the fridge, in the freezer, or you could store them with liquid nitrogen. So we're doing a lot of this. Uh, now on the fungal side of it, we've learned how to do this. So uh, most of the fungi are on the roots of the orchid and we can train somebody very quickly to look at this in, under a microscope and find out where the fungus is. And it turns out that in the root where the fungus occurs, all of the cells have these little structures in them called pelotons. And they're nothing more than like a little ball of fungal hyphae. And there are a lot of these in the cells and, and we know how to get them out, of, out and do something with them. So here's an example where here's an orchid root. We take that to the laboratory, look at it in a, in a sterile hood under a microscope. And under the microscope, you can see the pelotons. They're here, we've basically torn the root apart a little bit. Then we can take that and wash them and hopefully they're sterile put them on auger, and then if we're lucky and the or orchid hasn't yet uh, started to digest the fungus, we can actually get the fungus and grow it, and then we can store them in the lab. And we have the largest collection of orchid mycorrhizae in the world in, in our laboratory, well over a thousand specimens. Well, what do we know about this? Well, it turns out that we know very little about orchid fungi because they're not typical fungi. They're, most of them are not mushrooms. They're, they're, they're just some other structure, hard to see in the forest. And um, so how do we know what we have? How can we identify it? Well, what we do is we take the, the fungus that we've been growing and put it in liquid culture, growing it. Basically, it's the same. The liquid is the same as this. It just doesn't have the auger in it. We let the fungus grow and then we extract the DNA. And that's what these things represent. So we extract the DNA, clean it up, and then we send it to a laboratory. In this case, mostly it's a Smithsonian lab in Washington. And they, they send us back information. They send us back this kind of stuff based on what you see here. And what we do then is we take this information and we compare it on the internet with what's known for other fungi around the world. And that way, we can determine what we have. And so far about 95 plus percent of everything we've analyzed is new to science. They've never been, been identified, but they fall within very distinct groups of fungi that are fairly well known. So here's an example of how we store the fungi uh, on these racks and slants. Uh, we can store it in the lab, in a fridge, in a freezer. We not yet at the liquid nitrogen stage, I'm not sure we'll ever get to that because there's some evidence that that may not work so well. So with we use molecular techniques to identify the orchid mycorrhizae. That's the term that is used for them. 
for all, all fungi that interact with plants are called mycorrhizae. Uh, there are a few fungal genera that interact with orchids. They're not economically important, so scientists haven't studied them very often. As I mentioned, we have a very large collection and about 95% of them are new to science. The third stage of, of orchid conservation is to propagate them, to learn how to germinate the seeds, grow the plants in the lab. You're looking at here some, some seed plants that we've grown from seed we collected in Palau, a Pacific Island. We have a project out there. But as I mentioned earlier, what we want to do is we want to match up the seeds and the fungi that are from the same genetic area, same region, basically, uh, as much as we can, because we know because they were in nature that way, and that's the best way to, to learn how to propagate them. And then our goal is to take them eventually out of these containers like this and grow them in botanic gardens and grow them uh, in nature. And we just, we're just initiating a project, a five-year project, where we're going to select 25 native orchids from around the country, work with different groups, and we're going to, over five years, learn how to propagate them so we can give organizations like yours, individuals in your organization, with instructions if you want to grow this orchid in your area. So here's some pictures of them growing in the lab. These are under sterile conditions, all of these. Sterile conditions, sterile conditions. Uh, and over here, then you get them out of the sterile conditions and you grow them in containers. And uh, eventually you got to take these little boys and girls and figure out how to make big boys and girls out of them. And very, very few native orchids have made it to this stage yet, uh, especially with fungi. There's only a few studies where people have inoculated the fungi, grown the orchids, put them out, and been able to show that the fungi are still with them. Well, there's huge potential in this, not only from a conservation perspective, but from a horticultural perspective. Here are just some pictures of some of our native orchids, uh, mostly the, the lady slipper orchids and the uh, platanthras that have uh, enormous potential uh, to be used horticulturally around the country. Now, the reason I mentioned this is if you go back to those slides I showed you of in New York where the orchids are disappearing, I think that if we can figure this all out, what we can do is we can work with people like you to grow these things in your gardens and we can put orchids back into the landscape to create sustainable populations so they have a chance to spread on their own. And when you think about it, uh, some of you may live in houses that were at one time orchid habitat. There's a lot of that going on in strip malls and rows and things like that. So we think there's huge potential in learning how to propagate native orchids and working with botanic gardens and organizations on how to go about this. So I've thrown a lot at you, but the point I want to make is that none of this is easy. Uh, orchid conservation is really complex, and here's our view of it. It's really a puzzle. You have to know something about the orchids and their pollinators, if that's necessary. You have to know something about the seeds and how to germinate them, how long they live, all those things. And you have to be able to grow the plants and you have to be able to do this with fungi. And so we, we've yet to put this puzzle together completely for any native orchid. And that's, that's our goal though. And probably won't happen in my lifetime, but I wanna see it happen and hope that we can keep it going. Now, I'll switch at the end here and talk a little bit about education. As I mentioned, we're, we're committed to educating the public as much as we can to develop botanical literacy and, and engage them in hands-on conservation. We've done a few things to get at this. One of them is we have a website. I hope that uh, after tonight, some of you will visit this website. You can go to it on your phone or you can go to it on your, your PC or your laptop, whatever you've got. And it's called the North American Orchid Conservation Center. And there's a lot of stuff in here. So you can, uh, there's an, uh, there are links to our newsletters. There's a link to, to the gallery section, which has beautiful photos of native orchids by people that we interact with around the country. A lot of the science I've talked about tonight, you can find it there. And you can learn how to, to help us by donating and contributing to, to what we're trying to do. And you'll notice that there's a website over here, or there's a site here called Go Orchids. And this is where a site where we put a lot of our money and energy when we first started this. This website, which you can get to on your phone, on your pad, or on your laptop, 
or on your PC. Uh, this has all of the native orchids in the US and Canada on it. And you can you can you can get into it in a number of ways. You can you can uh, enter a state or a province, and up will come pictures of all the orchids in Tennessee, for example. Click on a picture; it'll take you into much more information about the species, photographs, uh, maps, all kinds of things. Or if you you know an orchid, you can type its name in here, the common name or the scientific name. Or if you're in the field doing botany and you find an orchid and you don't know what it is, you can actually go to this site and you can do keying. You can answer questions and it'll, every time you answer, you open it up and there'll be pictures of orchids and every it'll you answer questions. And every time you do that, the number of pictures goes down till you find your orchid. Uh, you can only use this though, uh, if you have access to the internet. And we're very close, uh, hopefully within the month, of sending a written version of this to Cornell University Press. And uh, hopefully in about a year and a half or two years, you will be able to buy a field guide to the native orchids of North America that we are going to publish. Uh, and so you have the electronic version as well as a, a hand carried version. Uh, I, I was in a, at a meeting in China some years ago and some guy was showing me a, a, a piece of paper that had a punch out model of a native orchid. And I thought, well, this is very cool. <clears throat> so I came back to the States and I got a grant to develop uh, paper punch out models of native orchids. And here are pictures of quite a few of them that have been put together after you punch them out of the paper. And uh, we have about 27 models are available. I could send you some, you can get on our website and find a link to these. And if you're interested in some, I can send them to you, you can purchase them. We've distributed about 60,000 sheets of these so far. Uh, luckily, we've had almost 20 individuals and organizations sponsor them because for each one of these, it costs about $5,000 to, to uh, create the, what the, the bit that's needed by the publisher <clears throat> to print them. And then of course you have to pay for the paper for the printing. But luckily, we've been able to get most sp sponsors for almost all of these. They're called Orchidgami. And here are some examples. So the, the, this group on the top, I went and gave a talk on Long Island. And before the talk, we had, a, had, a, had a, an origami session. And these are the models that the people put together before I gave the talk. Uh, this lady, there's a lady in Hawaii does this kind of stuff. She actually puts these together and enters them in orchid shows. She's really good at it. Uh, but here's some from Germany. The, these are the ghost orchid. This was used in a wedding. Uh, so you can put them in pots. You can do all kinds of things. So uh, again, go on our website. If you see some of these, I can send a few. If you want a, a bunch of them, I would sell them to you. But uh, that's not because I want to make money. It's because every cent that comes in from the sale of these things, uh, it gets plowed back into what we're trying to do. I don't get any money out of it. And then uh, a couple of years ago, this uh, Tuttle Publishing Company, this international company, they saw what we were doing and said, well, how about if we put together a box set of these models? And so we worked with them and you can buy on Amazon or it's available in some stores like Barnes and Noble. You can buy a box set of 20 of our models and in that, not only do you get the models, but you get a booklet that we've written, which has a lot of the stuff I've told you about with instructions on how to do it. And these are fairly popular. Uh, in fact, uh, about a month ago, we heard from the publisher, they're actually going to do the second printing. So that means somebody's buying them. And uh, so go on Amazon, uh, buy them. They're 20 bucks for a box set. And you're supporting us if you do that. And then here's something I'm pretty excited about. Um, we worked with these people at, at the Fairchild with the Million Orchid Project, and we came up with this thing called Orchids in the Classroom, where we have developed uh, protocols, methods, all that stuff for working in mostly middle schools, where we, we work with the teachers, we train them, and, they, and we give them material, we give them the orchids and the fungi, or whatever the experiments are, and the kids set up the experiment, and they run the experiment, and they report the data, and we've... Uh, piloted this in uh, in the DC area and it was very successful. The kids loved it, teachers loved it. 
And we just recently got a, um, a grant, uh, a half a million dollar grant for the next several years. And we're gonna take this program again in the DC metropolitan area, but we're gonna take it to Alaska, to Delaware and Minnesota. And my vision for this is that once this really takes off and everybody knows how to use it, this could be the STEM uh, equivalent that schools use to get kids excited in being little scientists and working with orchids and helping us because we actually have them do experiments with these things. Okay, so uh, I've talked a lot about what we do. Uh, this is just give you some idea of who we work with. So part of my job the last 10 years and Julianne McGinnis's has been to find collaborators around the country. So this is just a map and a listing of some of the organizations that we have collaborated with. The collaborations can be of different types. Some people collaborate by sending us a check every year. That's great. Some people collaborate by having members who um, who uh, collect orchids, seeds, and fund and roots for us, and we to, for we can process them. So we'll work with just about anybody that wants to help us in one way or another. So the take home message from my presentation is that orchid conservation is important. It's not easy. It takes a community of citizens like you, committed organizations like yours to conserve our native orchids. And eventually I think that in addition to the citizen scientists that botanic gardens and, and horticulture are gonna be very key to our ultimate success of restoring and conserving native orchids. And the other thing I have to mention is that there's no public money in this. The only federal salary is mine. And luckily I'm an old guy and I've been at the Smithsonian for a century and I'm at a place where I could do this and still do my science and publish and everybody's happy, but I could do this. But uh, there's Congress isn't gonna give us money to do this. So to make this successful, uh, we need folks like you and others to to help us through gifts and 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 grants, which we we look for and and write. So I'll end with a, a collage of some of our native orchids. I will put up our mission again to conserve our native orchid heritage, and I'll give a few thank thanks to people who have really helped us do this. The United States Botanical Garden. There's been a a, a suite of uh, of uh, directors that have helped us over the years. Uh, we've got a very new relationship going with Smithsonian Gardens. Uh, Joy Columbus is their new director, and she's very mm -hmm. excited to work with us and integrate this into what they do at the at the Smithsonian. Uh, the Natural History Museum has been involved with us, uh, and there are a couple of botanic gardens that we've worked with closely, the University mm -hmm. of Minnesota, Chicago. Uh, one of the most interesting uh, things is this program at Illinois College, and it um, that Larry Zettler started, uh, which is an undergraduate institution. And he trains more undergraduates to go into ecology and orchid ecology than anyone on the, on the planet. And there are a bunch of other folks. I want to talk about Helen Horowitz. She, she started our first little endowment, which we get you know, some money to do what we're doing every year. And there are people that are really committed to us, like Charlie and Trudy Hess in Texas. And then, of course, there are other folks at the Smithsonian who have worked with me and continue to work with me. So with that, I will uh, stop. If you're interested in what we do, you can sign up for our newsletter. Uh, all you have to do is get on the website and uh, click news. And, and you can also send an email to Julianne McGinnis and she will sign you up for our newsletter and our annual appeal that goes out in the, in the autumn. So with that, I will stop sharing. And we'll return to hopefully enough time for a few questions if you if you all have any. So thank you very much. There is one question already is, and that is from Toby. Uh, is there any information regarding the effect of rising soil temperatures on fungi? Uh, not not that I know of, but uh, you you really hit on a very good point, which, Fungi are probably the weakest of the two members of this interaction that occurs. So when, when the environment begins to change, it's, it's well, we've experimentally done this. We know the fungi are the first things to go. And if you don't have the fungus, you can't have a sustainable population. As far as I know, there have been, there have been a couple of European 
authors who have looked at this issue, not so much soil temperature, but just global climate change, where they've looked at the distribution of orchids where they occur now, and they've looked at climate models and said, well, how's that all going to change? And, and what's going to happen, of course, is that orchids are going to move north and up on mountains. And so there have been some predictions about this, but nobody has looked at it experimentally as far as I know. Well, Bettina says a fascinating talk. Okay. And Terry Joyce has a question. I have a group of yellow lady slippers given to me in 1918 when the owner was retiring and leaving his property. He brought a large amount of soil with them and I tried to prepare a suitable woodland habitat. The first year I had 22 beautiful blooms. Five years later, they have settled into about 12 blooms per year, presumably because some of the original fungal matter was has depleted. Is there a way to know what sort of fungi would help them to increase? Is there anything I can do to encourage the site? <laughs> The previous um, owner recommended supplying pine needles. Um, the answer is there's no for sure answer to, to your, your question. Uh, a couple of things uh, <clears throat> might be worth thinking about is the area where these orchids occur, is it getting shadier? So one thing you might do is if it's getting shadier is to do a little thinning of the understory or maybe even branches and a canopy tree, uh, that, that could, we've, we've done experiments with that. And we know that getting a little more light is beneficial uh, to, to the orchid. Um, on the fungal side of it, that's a tough one. Uh, <clears throat> there's very, well, there's really no information on, on what you can do to assure that the fungi that the orchid needs stays there in abundance other than keeping the habitat about the you know as close to what it should be originally or was originally we we're doing some experiments with isotria now that give a little bit of a hint uh, the if if a tree dies in the forest um, the the below ground part of the tree is basically food for every microbe in the world, for fungi, bacteria, all those things mm -hmm. that are eating roots and decomposing roots. And we have shown uh, that for isotria, that when a tree dies, the amount of fungi in the soil mm -hmm. increases by, increased by about 10x, 10 times. And, mm -hmm. and when that happened, we had, in one population where the tree died, we went from two plants, it had got started out with about 20 plants, went down to two, and after the tree died, in within three years, it was up to 80 plants. And those 80 plants clearly were plants that were dormant, some of them. Could have been some seedlings, but mostly dormant. So we're actually doing, uh, tomorrow, we're going to be going down to AP Hill, we're doing experiments in two national parks, or one national park and a military base, where we are experimentally uh, girdling a canopy tree and we're going to test this hypothesis and and some people think that you can increase the fungi by putting uh, wood chips or in the case your case pine needles pine needles probably not for the yellow lady slipper that's to me that doesn't seem to be the right thing i would think some other leaves but not pine needles uh any work on platanthra integra not that i know of Terry Joyce said 2018. Uh, she'd first written 1918, now it's 2018. Oh, two, I got you. Okay, I, okay, I got you. <laughs> okay. She says, I have some decaying wood at the site. That's good. I mean, you can't go wrong with that, I don't think. that That's a good way to go. Yeah. But I would, I would look at, at light, you know, maybe trying to open up the canopy a, a, a little bit. When, when go ahead, I, Alice. Hello. Go ahead, Alice. When I came to this country in uh, uh, practically 1959, 
I got very excited to find on my property Morala Hitza with Teriana, which needed to be identified by someone else because I didn't know any knowledge of it. So after the, the years after that, I marked the spot where the plant, plant or plants came up. Never did I find uh, uh, the orchid at the same spot again. And altogether, as uh, the theory seems to be, as the soil dark, darkens or the material, the, the woods darken, the koala heiser has practically disappeared from that area. Yeah, you've, you've hit on a very interesting point. Uh, a lot of orchids, um, some orchids where you see them, that's where they stay year after year after year after year. There are other orchids which actually move around. I think the the individual plants don't live that long, maybe three, four, five years, something like that. And uh, but remember, these these things all have wind dispersed seeds. So that Coralariza wisteriana, if you have one plant that produces fruits, it's probably producing a million seeds, which are being dispersed locally, and those seeds have the potential to to form uh, new plants. This uh, the Coralariza that we work with. At our property, the same thing has happened. We we have this big area, which is about the only place where the coral arisa occurs, and we've divided it into you know squares and things like that. And we we count the orchids and measure them every year. And over the 20, 25 years we've been doing this, the number has really declined. So something something has happened. We don't we have some ideas, but the other thing is uh, we think this goes back to this idea of climate change. It's it's drier where we are. And, and the orchids have moved from uh, one part of the plot down to the lower part where it stays moisture a little bit longer. So, so orchids are dynamic. They're gonna change over time. I don't, I don't think it had to do with, with it getting, uh, getting drier and the ground has not been disturbed since uh, since I discovered that in 1959, and uh, but uh, and there's a lot more uh, natural uh, plant plant material naturally from the foliage because the trees were already large, mm -hmm. and the trees got larger and uh, very large that they fell over by now over yeah. the decades. Yeah, there's another thing that's happened in many of our forests that we don't fully understand and, and that is that many of our forested habitats have been invaded by non-native earthworms oh. and uh in in the place where i work there are i don't know five or six native earthworms but we have about 35 species in the forest and those earthworms are uh they they turn over the soil they turn over the leaf litter but what they also can do when they're eating the soil and the leaf litter is they can eat orchid seeds. And so the orchid seeds pass through the body of the earthworm. When they come out the back end, some of them are not, <laughs> are not uh, the way they were when they went in. So we think that there's the potential that um, invasive earthworms are having an impact on some of our, uh, our orchids. And I don't know where you you know where you have these plants, Alice. But the other the other critter in the east that can have a big impact on orchids is our deer. Uh, the e eating the eating the orchids. There's some documentation of of that. So uh, this Isotria that we work with at 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 a national park and at a military base, we we put cages over each plant every year because the deer will eat them. Well, this uh, uh, this population uh, was, or maybe still is, uh, on Horse Mountain in Bedford County in Tennessee, which is the highest highest point of the county, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, with uh, uh, 
originally 1192 feet. So mm -hmm. practically 1200 feet. Um, I see there's a, there's a Rob, Robert Davis has said about uh, putty root orchid, a plectrum high molly that uh, he finds colonies of that in, in debris piles where fallen logs and branches. That's a really interesting thing, uh, Robert. Uh, an, an equivalent to the, the aplectrum is tipularia discolor, the crane fly orchid. And uh, I, did, I did a study we published on the crane fly orchid years ago. And one of the things we, we, we uh, noticed is we very rarely saw little baby orchids mostly all adults. And, and then we started looking and looking and looking. And then what we ended up finding was that most of the little crane fly orchids occurred on decomposing wood logs in the forest. And we did some further studies with these seed packets. And what we found is that the fungus that the, the crane fly orchid needs at the protocorn stage is completely different than the fungus that it needs as an adult. And it turns out that that fungus is mostly present in decomposing wood. So you could have the same sort of thing going on with, uh, 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 with your aplectum. The other thing is, is uh, aplectum, the, the wood piles are not, are not consumed by earthworms and things like that nearly as much as soil. So that could also, the wood could be like a little safe site for the little baby aplectrums. And the soil on, uh, for the Tipularia, I have built a cage over it, cage of a, a little or more than a square meter and uh, with, with uh, wire, heavy wire on top. And uh, that is, the largest population of, uh, of Tipularia. Also, the soil needs to be different. And I think a little more acid at, uh, for Tipularia. Because mm -hmm. all the landscape around is uh, a very uh, lime, limestone. Okay. Yeah. Do we have, okay. Tim commented, is soil pH critical for orchids? I understood that some require acidic soil. Yeah, particularly, you know, things that occur in wet, boggy habitats, they tend to be more acidic than, than forest. Um, <clears throat> in, in North America, uh, because in the East, because a lot of our orchids occur in the forest, um, it's probably, you know, pH of five to seven, something like that is okay. In Europe, a lot of the orchids only occur on on uh, basic soils and limestone. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't we don't have that so much in the U.S., but uh, it's really a key thing in in, uh, in in Europe. So pH pH is critical, and and one of the th one of the reasons uh, no one's shown this, I think that a lot of the orchids have had some problems. Uh, not so much right now, but you know, during the 60s, 70s, and 80s, we had acid rain everywhere. And that was lowering the pH of many of our forests. And uh, that was probably not good for uh, for the fungi or, or the orchid, but particularly the fungi. Any other questions? If so, just unmute yourself and you may ask. Anybody? Very interesting, thank you. Okay, well, thank you all. And I hope you'll spend some time uh, looking at our websites, learning a little bit more about what it is we're doing. And if uh, you have further information, you you can contact me. We'd be happy to, to email you or, or answer questions if we can. And uh, so continued success, enjoy all of your native plants. Uh, we have to stick together, keep them all happy. And I do have one of the orchids. Hey, okay, you got it. One of the or origami orchids. Right. <laughs> They're fun. They are. They are. Uh, They're yeah. challenging. To do. They, they are. It's good Good for hand-eye coordination for people yes. with white hair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Maybe I should wear it in my hair. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent talk. Thanks. Thank, thank you all very much. Yeah. Uh, enjoy. Bye bye. This thank was you, absolutely Andrew, excellent. Who gave me the book set of the uh, of the orchids and the the book and and the models are just great. I have not quite managed the models, but I have read the book. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, good night, everyone, and thank you for coming. And night. hopefully we'll see you next month.